Whole Foods CEO, John McKay, was actually on a podcast, Freakonomics, I believe it's called. And this was making news and it was, it was uh, trending on Twitter. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to go and read some of the, treat, the tweets and retweets because um, his message, it doesn't sound that, you know, far-fetched, at least in terms of, you know, probably your perspectives and viewpoints because you watch a health channel. And certainly mine, as I understand, you know, the chronic disease pandemic, the epidemic of diet and lifestyle related diseases of obesity, hypertension, type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, cancer, autoimmunity, all of those diseases uh, are, are allocating about 70% of all of the healthcare expenditures. So, of course, it's reasonable to presume and, and throw out this idea that, man, if Americans just ate better, 70% of all healthcare expenditures could essentially go away or be dramatically reduced. And so, yeah, we wouldn't need to spend as much money on healthcare, right? And the tweets, <laughs> get ready, grab some popcorn, crack open a beer, because the these tweets are going to blow your mind. Friends, this is why we need to spread this message because <laughs> wait till you see the crap that people said. All right, so what you're seeing here is the most liked and retweeted tweet. Let me read it to you in case you're driving right now. This is from Grant Stern. This is public, right? You can find this. Some people might say I didn't anonymous. This is all public, right? He says, this is insane. People can't eat their way into being healthy. <laughs> what? what? Really? Like people believe this, that you cannot eat your way into health. <clears throat> Raise your hand if I, if I could see you right now. I mean, write in the comments or hit that like button. Let me know. Have you eaten your way into better health? And, and is the converse true? Have you eaten your way into poorer health? The answer is yes and yes. I mean, friends, it, how much more obvious does this need to be? Now, he says, what are they supposed to do? Eat better when you fall off a bike or catch a virus? Well, falling off a bike is is leading, is creating an acute illness, okay? Or it's it's an injury, it's trauma. We and the point of this video and this podcast is not just to you know talk about all these treat, tweets and retweets and to vilify people or anything. It's to help you mentally create a box, a conceptual framework for understanding there is a difference between chronic disease and acute disease. Okay, so they they we we ought not confuse them uh, together. So if we think about falling off a bike, creates trauma, which is characterized by an acute disease. So you go to the health professional, the doctor, you have stitches, you have wounds, you have trauma that needs to be fixed, okay? Very simple. The solution, it's cured, you're, you're done, you leave, you, your stitches dissolve, you heal your bones, you move on. Now, by the way, your nutrition and your diet and lifestyle choices will accelerate or or can decelerate that that trauma recovery. It makes sense. Look at look at the the research on elective surgical procedures, orthopedic sur surgeries in people that are overweight or diabetic or people that are that are obese. They have a higher prevalence of failed surgeries, uh, revisions, and they have more post surgical complications and post surgical infections. Okay, so. So Grant, number one, yes, even in the context of a bike, nutrition and lifestyle still matters in a bike injury. And number two, or catch a virus. Yeah, I mean, look, what are the common comorbidities uh, that, are, that, are, that are the high percentage of patients that are dying from the virus? 96% of people that are dying from this virus, which I've been exposed to and have been infected with, and I will tell you that my 25 years of health promotion and lifestyle change prior to getting that infection led to a very mild case. And I didn't, I didn't have a lot of, I wasn't, you know, spreading the virus because the mild cases have uh, reduced viral load, lower viral load means less uh, super spreading. So anyway, uh, Grant, yes and yes. So sorry, you need to go back to the drawing board, Grant. And this is something that we've been talking a lot about, friends, and that's that the current public health crisis, you know, the one that I'm talking about, caused by the virus SARS-CoV-2. It's a syndemic. You have the collision, the crash course, the 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 convalent, the overlay of two epidemics occurring at the same time. You have the chronic disease epidemic and that that's being canvassed or baked into or or infused with this transmissible microbe that is disproportionately affecting people that have chronic disease. So your hypertension, your diabetes, let me just expand this 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 uh, illustration here, I think it's it's just beautiful that shows that that obesity, diabetes, hypertension, all of that is increasing the vulnerability 
to poor outcomes with the virus. So it goes back to Grant, like, yo, Grant, where, what rock have you been living under where you don't realize that at least in the, in the U.S. and even other parts of the world, a super majority of people that have severe cases have diseases that are caused by poor diet. So absolutely nutrition matters. So, um, Really interesting stuff. Now, now here's another one from this guy, uh, Bickman in Brickman in uh, GA. I assume that's Georgia. Great news, everybody. John McKay at Whole Foods has the cure for autoimmune disorders, allergies. We can't really talk about broken bones, although that is related to nutrition, heart disease, strokes, etc. You need to pay an exorbitant prices for your groceries at Whole Foods, but the bonus is you'll never need health care. It's a miracle. Okay. So let's just pause. Let's take a taco time out. So um, uh, Brickman in Georgia did kind of conflate and, and kind of mix acute diseases with chronic diseases right there. So broken bones. Uh, although if you, you know, if you look at osteoporosis, osteopenia, there is a strong connection between diet and lifestyle. I mean, duh, it goes without saying. Uh, issue, uh, you know, there's a lot of people that don't exercise, people that don't have weight-bearing loads from, from activity are more prone to having brittle bones. People that have poor diets have more brittle bones. And so, you know, some people will say that, you know, when, when grandma, you know, uh, fell and broke her hip, it was really the breaking of her hip that caused the fall. I mean, you'll hear that a lot from doctors that, that treat people with low bone mineral density. Uh, and, and so, um, you know, what's the chicken or the egg? And, and so it's interesting to, to look at that. So obviously that's, that's ameliorable with the diet and lifestyle change. Autoimmune diseases. This is actually so... If you understand the, the healthcare industry and the insurance industry, you need to understand that there's the insurance companies are not kind of the end all uh, in the sense of a financial uh, sense. They are insured as well by so called reinsurers. So the reinsurers are really concerned that the healthcare uh, insurers are spending a lot of money managing these disease, diseases that they can uh, medically manage with diet and lifestyle. So in the case of autoimmunity, and in the case of diabetes, Swiss Re, which is a reinsurer for many of the big, um, you know, healthcare uh, insurers, is actually really interested in in figuring out ways that they can reduce. Because look, if you're an insur insurer, right, you can't charge people ten thousand dollars a month for insurance. I mean, people, there's just a finite amount of of dollars people can afford to pay for insurance, so they can make more profit if they make you know, their uh, subscriber base healthier and they don't have to spend all this money on all, all the, you know, end of life care and uh, comorbidities and, and disease management with multiple specialists, right? So they're, they, they're incentivized financially to figure out diet and lifestyle ways that they can improve people's chronic conditions. And autoimmunity and diabetes are two, uh, and these are listed right here by uh, Brickman in Georgia, two of the most kind of responsive chronic conditions that are uh, amenable to diet and lifestyle change. So so yes, Brickman in Georgia. Um, sorry, you're wrong, dude. I mean, man, okay, now if you have type one diabetes, okay, there's not a, there, there are some things, obviously, you don't want to eat a high carb diet, they'll, they'll necessitate more insulin, which is not good and all of that. But, but if you have something like asthma, or you get scleroderma or lupus or MS later in life or Crohn's, you know, things like that, you can obviously do a lot with nutrition and lifestyle to reduce the symptoms and reduce the need for medication and all of that. So um, really interesting stuff in heart disease. I mean, give me a break. Even if you look at some of the vegan data and, and some of the data that, that in a keto carnivore community and changing biomarkers and, uh, you know, uh, arterial uh, uh, viscosity and all these different things and that elasticity was the word I'm looking for, the pulse wave velocity test. We talked about that before with Dr. Scott. Um, so just so much data here. Uh, it's just sad to me that people don't understand this, that there's a connection. And so I just kind of wanted to uh, to come on here and just share with you guys, because I know some of you don't really go on Twitter to sort of look at these things because you're like, dude, I got better things to do. And I, I understand but I get tagged in these things. And some of the comments were just absolutely mind blowing. But anyway, let's kind of talk about this because I think this is a really important um, aspect that we all should consider. So let's talk about, this is a, a really good paper that many of you should actually read. Uh, Patients as partners in managing chronic disease. So there's sort of this sentiment or this idea amongst people that, you know, when you go to the doctor, you just listen to everything they say, you don't talk, they have the diagnosis and the cure and the solution in 15 minutes or less and you're out the door. And you don't need to really do anything different besides 
get the, the surgical procedure or the intervention that they recommend or take the drug as prescribed. Like that's kind of all you need to do. But that's not really working. And that's why in the United, <clears throat> the U.S., and other countries, we're spending so much, you know, we're allocating so much dollars to to medically managing people, but the outcomes are not all that good. And so if you look at, at this, as they talk about in this article, 70% of all healthcare expenditures are being allocated to manage the diseases that these individuals are saying are not treatable from diet and lifestyle. So the hypertension, the obesity, the diabetes, the prediabetes, the autoimmunity, the chronic inflammation, all of these things are amenable to diet and lifestyle change. So when if you want to improve your health, you can't just be passive about this and just say, oh, I went to my doctor and I take the pill that they said. You actually need to also participate. You need to be, to, to and studies have shown this, online education, diet change, uh, you know, prescribing uh, mindfulness-based meditation, you know, improving sleep with stress reduction strategies. There, there's so many different you know, studies now that have looked at this in outpatient clinics and primary care clinics and family medicine clinics that I guess people don't realize that there's actually good research to show that, yeah, you, know, you don't just passively take the pill because what that creates is then you have to take another pill that, to, to offset some of the side effects created by the first pill and, and on and on it goes. And I'll share with you a tweet that actually is just quite interesting in just a moment. But does this sort of make sense? I want to just check into the comments here. Um, I think a lot of you all get this. You understand. You, but but a lot of your neighbors, like your friends, your coworkers, they don't get this stuff. Like we, we have to constantly remind people that the healthcare system, uh, you know, is a super majority of its spending is on treating and, and, and you know, uh, affecting diseases that are caused by people's own nutrition choices and diet and lifestyle choices. So um, I do want to let you all know we have a great new formula out. This is D3 Absorb that features 5,000 international units per serving of bioavailable vitamin D3 that's delivered in an organic extra virgin olive oil. So if you want to support your body's vitamin D levels this winter, definitely check out some of the savings that we have on this formula. And we have uh, really, it's really a, an affordable way to uh, get your vitamin D levels up. You can give this to kids, put it in smoothies. Uh, I give this to my dogs as well. Dogs need vitamin D. So uh, definitely check that out. Okay, so um, let's get into... <laughs> Let's get into th this. Was a funny tweet, and this got this got a lot of engagement here. Oh, and yes, eating a bunch of whole grains and fresh vegetables from Whole Foods will totally help me if I, uh, you know, trip on the curb. Okay, so again, we're we're conflating acute problems with chronic problems, and so yeah, um, look, if you have an acute disease, um, you, you know, or a laceration or trauma. Uh, you know, some of the things that we're talking about from a dietary standpoint don't really necessarily apply um, until you're in the recovery phase where they do apply. So, of course, you know, we, we don't want to totally uh, eradicate the entire healthcare system. Uh, we need we need acute trauma, right? Accidents happen, of course. Um, so, but no one's actually saying that, that you should have whole grains either. So that's not what we're saying here. Um, okay, so this was a, a kind of a funny... Uh, tweet from Molly. Molly says, I exercise and eat incredibly healthy. I don't smoke or do drugs. And guess what? Jackass, she says. Uh, I still have lupus. Uh, okay, so what was interesting about this particular tweet is I actually looked at some of the media that she offered in in her uh, you know, on her Twitter, and there was a bunch of pictures of cookies and junk food and stuff like that. So that was, uh, that was sort of interesting. So uh, Molly... Um, Maybe hopefully those were just seasonal cookies and things like that. But uh, then I saw this other tweet and I thought this was kind of interesting. Um, this lady says, "But I cured my epilepsy and chronic and crippling depression with chia seeds." Okay, by the way, um, there's a, a large uh, dossier data showing that the ketogenic diet is effective for treating epilepsy uh, and also depression. There's a lot of data showing that diet and lifestyle change improves mental health. Okay. Um, and then she says, she goes on to say, uh, she talks about her arthritis and her degenerative disc disease. So, 
Anyway, I made the mistake of getting into like a Twitter back and forth with this person because I was like, hey, actually, uh, you know, a lot of the research on the ketogenic diet, uh, you know, comes from its effectiveness in the context of epilepsy, which after the drug Dilantin was, was you know, uh, discovered and so forth, all that research kind of got swept under the rug. So you might want to consider diet and lifestyle change. And then she went on to talk about all these other conditions and then all these other specialists and and, and, and that none of them have ever mentioned to her that she should change her diet. So therefore, my suggestions were not based on science. And I thought, gosh, that's just not the right way to think about it. So, so what you're saying is that there's absolutely no connection between epilepsy, depression, degenerative disc disease, uh, and then what else? The arthritis, the osteoarthritis, which which really is triggered by by obesity related, you know, excessive body fat, uh, leptin levels. We can dive into that. And so when people lose body fat uh, and their leptin goes down, the arthritis in their hands gets better. So it, it people think that osteoarthritis is caused by just weight gain, but it's actually the metabolic hyperinflammatory environment as a result of that weight gain. So. <laughs> I, I went in and we, we got into this this uh, conversation, which maybe I shouldn't have I shouldn't have done. Let's see where is it? Um, uh, the tw the tweet's not even showing up here. Anyway, so I said, well, you know, Janine, like, what's I just said real quick. So, what do you think the solution is? You just take a drug for this, drug for that, and then a drug to counteract the side effects of this and that. But do you really think that's sustainable? Um, and she really didn't have a lot of solutions or, or answers outside of the fact that uh, I'm an insensitive jerk and why would I even be commenting on this tweet? So anyway, friends, the point of this video is we need to share with people, number one, that of course nutrition matters when it comes to a chronic disease epidemic that's, that's being canvassed over an infectious disease pandemic. Of course it matters because this is a syndemic, okay? You need to understand that, number one. And number two, we need to share with our friends and family that the healthcare system spends more than 70% of all of its you know, time, money, resources, and so forth, managing diseases that can be improved, and data has shown this, improved by diet, exercise, and lifestyle change. And this is not news. And if you have a chronic condition, the onus is on you to participate in your health, to, to start to learn more, to exercise more, to, to undergo stress reduction strategies, to you know, improve your social connections, to do all that, to change how you think about the world and everything. So anyway... I'm preaching to the choir. You all know this. So let's get into some of your comments here. All right, all right. What do we got? Um, friends, thanks for being here. Remember, if you hit the like button, that tells the uh, YouTube algorithm that more people should should see this. Okay, what do we have in terms of comments here? Okay, Richard says, I'm on my third doctor in three years. Um, these uh, fools just keep giving me different blood pressure meds and keep uh, recommending an SSRI. I have to do research on my own. Yeah, uh, Richard, I hear that so, so often. You need to find a doctor who's open-minded and um, will actually um, respect your lifestyle uh, change decisions. John D says, um, good for you for doing your own research and staying on top of it. Yeah, super important is to study this. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see, let's see. Um, Maria says, high fructose corn syrup and soda is a killer. I was at my local convenience store and... Uh, to get gas and you can get a 20 ounce fountain soda for a dollar. I mean, that's just, that's just, how could it be a dollar? I mean, I, I believe you, but this goes to show these government subsidies are, are creating the, 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 this, you know, this system to where people can sell food to where normally people would be losing money. Everyone, how can you drive transport and refrigerate soda across the country and everyone's making money, right? I mean, it's it's sugar water um, from genetically modified corn, right? That needs to be, you know, anyway, so it's just how is that even possible without subsidies? And that's part of the problem. And then it makes you question, you're like, well, if the government subsidizes this crappy food that makes people sick, then why are they now so concerned about us wearing face masks and staying in our home and shutting down our businesses and all that? Um Danielle says, the key is to to um, get health the F up. I'm with you, uh, Danielle. Um, Anna says, uh, go to your local natural food store. Exactly. Um, so so let's get into the finances of this. Obviously, you know, some people said like Whole Foods is a ripoff. Like, you know, this guy's a, a John McKay's a billionaire or whatever. Um, so I get it. You know, Whole Foods is expensive. But 
they also supply jobs to people who, you know, I remember going in like the crappy neighborhoods in Chicago when there was a Whole Foods. And so there's a lot of people that had work because of this, which is good. And they're also uh, creating, you know, food solutions, resources for f healthier food in regions of the country where, where healthy food was unaccessible. And, and what they did to the industry, which is nice um, in the grocery business, is they caused all of the other groceries to level up, to offer more organic, chemical-free, uh, to be more transparent about where their meat comes from and, and humane practices on slaughtering animals and all of that. So you can say Whole Foods, yeah, this guy's uh, you know worth like billions of dollars. He's a blah, blah, blah. He's an elite. Okay, I understand that, that. But also you should be learning from people who are in better financial positions than yourself to wonder, hey, what sort of characteristics do they have that I don't that, you know, might help me get closer to where they're at if you're so inclined to be in a more financially prosperous situation, number one. But number two, you know, um, it's not all bad and he helps to change the industry. Okay, uh, Crystal says, um, you might want to get a great YouTuber of the city, okay? Uh, what else we got? Joshua, what's going on, Joshua? Joshua says, it's not that the Whole Foods is expensive, it's that the processed food is unnaturally cheap. You know, this is an excellent point. You know, if you if you subsidized you know beef and coconut oil and eggs and you know butter i mean gosh it would it would be super cheap um so yeah it's it's you know uh, you have to think about well why is it that way okay impulse response says if they supply a job doesn't mean they have to rip off um consumers um yeah i mean these are higher margin items so as josh just pointed out um grass-fed beef um you know, organic single origin coffee, organic single origin chocolate, you know, some of those things are, are expensive, uh, organic almond, uh, flour, you know, chips or whatever, like all these things, they're more expensive than what you might be used to because the, the, the cost of Franken food, it, it, it's so low because, you know, the ingredients are subsidized by the government. So it's not, unfortunately the playing field is not, not that, not correct, but I'm with you, impulse response. Anna says, I work at uh, Mom's Organic uh, local business in D.C. area. That's cool. I'll, I'll have to check that out. And uh, I love helping people and supporting their health. Uh, amazing. Anna, I love natural food stores too. So um, hats off to you. That's my, when I travel. I go to every natural food store I can. So I, I've been you know, in Indiana, um, all over Oregon, every state on the West Coast, um, Texas, all the natural, a lot, a lot of the natural food stores there. I mean, it's just, it's kind of fun to do. It's like a weird, like, I don't know, like a thing that I do when I travel. Anyway, um, um, Arjuri says, uh, good for you for advocating for whole foods. Eating whole foods is cheaper than prescription meds. Yeah. And you don't have side effects. You have side benefits. Okay. Mike says, what are your thoughts on lectins? Yeah. You know, I, I, you know obviously we, we've done a couple interviews on this with Stephen Gundry uh, we talked about this, you know, with Paul Saladino before. Um, I think lectins can be pro-inflammatory. Uh, it goes way back to the work that uh, Lauren Cordain, the, the original pioneer of the, the paleolithic diet, she's talked about le lectins for a long time and some of the immunogenicity associated with lectins. So, of course, the data is there. Um, are they the end of the world? I think if you have autoimmunity, if you have asthma, if you have allergies, if you have skin issues, food sensitivities, probably avoid them. If you have them periodically, like tomatoes in, in the late spring, probably not that big of a deal. Um, so that's that's what I would say. So anyway, great, great uh, question there. Everyone's so unique. Um, are they the, the devil in everyone? Probably not. Um, Crystal says, I try to be as clean as possible, but it is also because my pocket allows it. How about, um, how can I help people out who can't afford it? Crystal, this is a question of our, of our time. Um, you know, because not everyone can afford healthy stuff. A lot of people are unemployed now, um, or their jobs are minimum wage jobs, or, you know, one parent is in prison, Right. So what do you do in that sort of situation? And I think it, it comes down to we all have to get closer to our food. And one of the coolest things that I saw, as many of you know, I, I used to travel for consulting. Um, uh, and so I would go to Detroit quite often. And there was community gardens in inner city, largely bl black and brown communities, um, just outside of Detroit. And 
there's all these people getting together. I saw them out there like incorporating the family, kids and all that to maintain these gardens. And so I, I think this is a solution, you know, and, you know, in certain parts of New York and Brooklyn and the Bronx, you, you see some of that going on too. But I think that's the solution. And is it the perfect solution, right, for everyone? No, but again, if you... If you're out in the garden, I've noticed this because we've had gardens now for six years. Um, you know, you start to just get more connected, and you you start to see, okay, well, you know, uh, spinach is growing now, carrots are growing now, but they're not growing in July, right? And I'm saying now is in like spring. So then you you get more in harmony with the seasons, and I think your microbiome might change a little bit throughout the season. So you might be absorbing different nutrients and all that. So anyway, I, I think that solution that's the solution. I, I'm not really totally sure, but. Um, it's certainly better than the alternative, which is a lot of convenience stores that are selling hyper palatable processed food, right? So um, that's the, that's the uh, I think that's the solution. So friends, um, that's what we got going on today. Uh, thank you for being here. And uh, if you're still here and you're enjoying this content, please hit that like button. If you would like to support your body's declining vitamin D levels this winter, definitely check out our new D3 Absorb. So if you live north of Atlanta, Georgia, Okay, which is most people between now and really like late March, even if you get natural sunlight and you go outside, you're not going to get enough cutaneous synthesis, which is synthesizing via by way of the sun on your skin of vitamin D. Okay, it's just not going to happen even if you're getting outside. While I recommend going outside, it's important, it's healthy, all of that. It's just the zenith angle of the sun is not sufficient enough. Again, if you live north of Atlanta, Georgia, so what do you what do you do? you should support your body's declining vitamin D levels. There's a lot of options out there, but what we like here is an organic uh, vitamin D that, that is suspended and uh, delivered in an organic extra virgin olive oil. So definitely check that out for, over on our website, myoscience.com. Friends, uh, have a great evening. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks for watching all the way through, and we'll catch you all soon. Bye now.